and I now want you to bring the house down for Veronica Belmont. I look, I look so serious. That's a big serious face on the wall. I'm not that serious. Thank you, thank you so much for having me, and I, I'm glad we did make it work. I, I've been so happy to be here, and the country is just absolutely beautiful, and I've had an amazing time so far. Okay. Before we begin, you have to say what you told me before. We made a mistake not making this a longer stay. Yes, I did say that. Yeah, and we I will <laughs> also have to bring in one more person. I have to bring in one more person? And the one more person is called? Is wait, which one? Which one do you want to talk about? Like your husband. Oh, you want my you want me to bring my husband? Yes, yes, I will bring my husband next time. I guess, whatever, fine. If he wants, I guess. No, he's 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 great. He's he's busy doing his own new company right now, so he's in the trenches on his new startup. So maybe next year once they're a little more settled. Before we go into more serious things, we have uh, one sentence to my brother and to your friend, right? Yes. So we will do this officially. Yes. Okay, guys. So someone should record this and post it on Facebook, on Snapchat, on Twitter, on every possible social media platform. So my brother, Nicola, the young one, is a huge fan of Felicia Day. And everyone knows I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Veronica Belmont. So we had like a wager a few years ago who will be the first person to speak at Spark Me stage? So, three words for my brother. In your face, a loser. <laughs> I'm not done, I've got one too. I've got one. In your face, Felicia, I'm in Montenegro. <laughs> okay, so y our session, I had something completely in mind. But then you said, no, we should go with the not so glamorous life of a new media personality. You strictly refused me calling you a celebrity. I don't like so that. So why is that first? It's because, I, I don't know, that, that word is very loaded, I think. And I just, that's not how I feel. I, I'm just, I, I, I don't, it feels weird every time someone says that. And it's just, I don't know, I, it's hard to explain. Yeah, personality is okay. I definitely have personality. Okay. <laughs> I don't see because of the lights. Where is Atsa? Would you consider Veronica a celebrity? Oh, yeah. he's, he's, <laughs> he's like your biggest fan girl ever. He, we had a great talk about Game of Thrones. He's, he knows his stuff. I told you. For sure. Okay, so let's take it from the start. Like your first official real job was in CNET in Boston. Like a big in San media. Francisco. San Francisco, yeah. sorry. Mm -hmm. Like big media house. Coming from this part of the world, when we read about those things, it seems like a dream job. Was it a dream job? So why did you quit then? Oh, okay, so absolutely, yeah. I moved out to San Francisco in 2004 after I graduated college and I went to school for audio radio production. And uh, I wanted to work in, in audio somehow. I didn't know what that was going to look like. And I wanted to move to San Francisco because I wanted to be where technology was happening. Um, for me, coming from Boston, there's a lot of high tech there, there's a lot of great things happening, but San Francisco was the place. And so three of, uh, me and two of my girlfriends packed up a car and drove cross country over two weeks. And we got to San Francisco with just the clothes on our back. We didn't have an apartment, we didn't have a job, we didn't have anything. Um, we found all of that on Craigslist uh, very quickly. Uh, we found an apartment, uh, one of the girls still lives there now, 12 years later. And I found a, um, I found a temp job uh, in a different industry that I was able to pay my rent with, and a skincare company, weirdly. And I found an internship on Craigslist uh, for an audio producer at CNET. And that was, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that I had an opportunity to, to start as an intern at a company like CNET. Because for me, that was the be all, end all of, of where technology was happening. And I started working there and eventually began producing all of their in-house podcasts. Um, and then I couldn't keep my big mouth shut and I started talking on the podcasts. And then from there, my boss at the time said, hey, you know, you seem to really love doing this. Why don't you try your hand at writing scripts and 
producing your own content and being on camera. That was something I had the never. The year is? Huh? The year is? The year is, it, this is 2005. Okay, so you were basically doing it before it was cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I, I started doing that, and it was great because I was doing all the parts of the production. I was writing the scripts, I was uh, editing the videos, and I was hosting them. So I got to have a real appreciation for the entire you know, content creation process. And I think that really helped me in the future, kind of understand how to be a good on-air host and how to write scripts in a way that were convenient for editors, for example. Um, and I, I loved doing it. But I left, I did leave. I, I was there for about three and a half years. And I kind of started getting the sense that if I didn't leave, I never would. And for me, I, I, as a young person just starting out my career, I, I felt like there was more. And CNET's a wonderful place, and I still have a lot of friends that work there, but I, I wanted to do something that was a little more outside the box. And I don't know if I ever would have been able to do that. And I remember years ago, uh, a friend of mine who, who worked there as well uh, told me that when I left, someone told her that she's gonna regret that. She's gonna regret leaving. Like, she'll be back. And- In a good way or in a bad in way? A bad way? In a bad like way. Like, she's making a huge mistake. Yeah. Like, this is gonna ruin her career. And that just really stuck with me. That kind of like, oh really, I'll show you. Like that, even though I <laughs> don't know who it was, but it, it kind of spurned me on in a way that was, that was very uh, interesting. Okay, so going outside the box mm -hmm. means you going from CNET to Mahalo. Yes. I perfectly remember that moment. Really? But yeah, like really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how many people in the audience first have, are the same age as I am. Have heard of Mahalo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have heard of Mahalo, have heard of Jason Kelakanis, and know about your move. So could you please explain first what Mahalo was, mm -hmm. and then your position in Mahalo. Uh, Mahalo was the first uh, human-powered search engine. It was a curated search site uh, that was founded by Jason Calacanis, and he was, he, I mean, I, Jason is one of those people in my life. It had changed everything. I mean, he's, he's still to this day one of my mentors. Um, he, in, he, put, he basically introduced me to my husband. That's how he'll tell the story anyway. Um, he, <laughs> he spoke at my wedding. He's a dear, dear friend and uh, a wonderful person to learn from. And he made an offer I couldn't refuse. He said, come, come to the company. Uh, they were down in Santa Monica, uh, near LA at the time. So I would fly down there for two weeks out of the month and shoot content. And so we made a video series called Mahalo Daily that was centered around the popular search terms on mahalo.com. And so we were kind of gaming the SEO at the time. So we would do a video like how to learn how to play guitar. And then that would be like the top result for that in, in Google search results. And then that whole thing would kind of trickle down and be good traffic for us. But we were also making really fun educational content. And I did that for about eight months and I did really enjoy it, but they were really trying to go more general interest, more entertainment focused, um, more pop culture. And for me, that wasn't where my interest lay. I wanted to be more heavily into technology. I wanted to kind of go back to those roots that I had at CNET, uh, we'll talk more about gaming and, and internet culture. And so I, I left to, to do two new projects after that. And what happened? So Mahalo is, if I recall correctly, a Hawaiian word? Yeah. Mahalo means thank you in, in Hawaiian. Okay. And so Jason just loves Hawaii, so yeah. that's how that happens. So what happened after with Mahalo after you left? Um, they, they continued doing the show for a while. We actually had a, a uh, competition for the next person to come on to take over, and we're kind of like an American Idol style show. Um, and it was a lot of fun. It stuck around for a while, and then you know Jason has since gone on to do a lot of great companies, his work with Inside.com and Launch. Um, now are, are taking up most of his focus as well as his incubator, the launch incubator, um, of which I'm an advisor for, for some of the companies there. Okay, awesome. Uh, any World of Warcraft fans in the room? One yeah. guy. You <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Horde or Alliance? Both? No. You, you cannot pick both. You can't, you can't, okay, well, whatever. For the Horde. <laughs> And you're for the Horde? I'm for the Horde, uh -huh. yes. Okay, so one of your first interviews ever at Mahalo was with? Leroy Jenkins. Leroy Jenkins. Leroy Jenkins. Come on. Thank you. At least we have chicken. At least I have chicken, yeah.
Like, I love that one guy laughed at that joke. <laughs> Thank you. You're my new friend. <laughs> yes, so but the guy who did Leroy Jenkins was one of my, was my first interview for the show. At the time, mm -hmm. it was like arguably the most popular video online. It was the meme. Yeah, it was like yeah. the thing. Yeah. yeah. But a lot of time has passed since then. So Ten years. They just had the 10-year anniversary really? of Leroy Jenkins, ah. like a month ago. So oh, we're old. Yeah. No. <laughs> You didn't need to mention this one, okay. okay. But you're sick, still 27, right? Yes, yeah, forever, okay. yes. Okay. So what, how, from like after 10 years, how would you look at that moment and that interview? Is it something like that hindered your career in some way? Or is it something that like made you even more popular? Or was it something that got you recognized with the geeks, associated with like the geek culture or? Yeah, you know, I never really thought about it. Um, it was it was a very popular video at the time, um, and it was my one of my first non it was my first non CNET video, and it it, it did get a lot of press uh, just because you know he was such a, a a figure at the time, and that video was so popular that we kind of we did what we did with the whole show, which is jump on that moment and and kind of make it ours in a way. And it was it, I thought it was great. I I just remember the the feeling I had of being so nervous because. It was a new experience for me, and I, I think I kind of carried that with me for a long time. About you know, if you're passionate about something and you're excited about it, that's going to come through on camera, and I think it did. And that's kind of how I've done my career since then. Is I talk about topics that I'm excited about, that I'm passionate about, and you know, the viewers see that and they sense that, and I think that resonates with people, and that's why it works. Uh, whenever someone wants to post a question, so just keep your hand up high and one of our volunteers will come with the mic and I will mix it with my own questions. So if this is the right time, so just raise your hand and keep it raised and I'll continue asking questions. That and sounds then exhausting. You. No. <laughs> we'll okay. try to keep the questions okay. shorter, don't yeah. worry. For them, I meant to hold yeah, their hand, yeah. okay. So soon after that one, the very famous podcast, which is like even nowadays a legend, Sword and Laser, mm. you're doing with Tom Merritt, it's still operational after many, many years. How did it begin? How, first, wha what was your connection to Tom Merritt? How did you start Sword and Laser? For like the non-Uber nerds like I am, what is Sword and Laser all about? Sure. Um, Sword and Laser is a sci-fi fantasy podcast, video show, and book club that we've been doing since 2007. Um, we've been doing the audio version of the show since 2008. And it's, uh, it's been, the way it got started was Tom and I were working at CNET together, and I was about to leave back in 2007. And we wanted to find a project that we could continue to work on together. And so we wanted to figure out what are we most excited talking about that's not technology, because he couldn't do a technology show because he was still at CNET. And so we said, well, I love fantasy books and he loves science fiction. Let's do a show where we teach each other about the other genre and really kind of figure out like what we most love about these books and, and share that with each other. And so we started doing the book club on a small social network called Ning. And then we, we were there for about a year and then Goodreads launched. And uh, I knew Otis through Tony because um, True was, a, was an investor in Goodreads. And so he made that connection. And ju until just recently, we were the largest book club on Goodreads. Uh, we were supplanted by Emma Watson, which that's fine, I get that. That's totally understandable. <laughs> Okay, we'll <laughs> She's kind of we'll amazing. Give her that up. Yeah, um, but the the book club's been going great. We've had some of the biggest authors in the industry on the show for the video show and for the podcast. Um, we've had George R. R. Martin on. We've had Neil Stevenson. We've yeah, we had. We all hate you for the first one. Yeah, no, he was he was fantastic. Uh, he was very funny, and in fact, uh, I was that was also one of the most nervous I've ever been doing any interview in my life. Um, but the second I asked him about, I knew he was a comic book nerd. So I was like, so tell me, like, who's your favorite, like, Marvel hero? And he lit up. And that was, like, the key to getting him to open up and really talk. And that's kind of the key to any interview is, is find that thing that gets the person excited. And then they will really, you know, the, the floodgates open. And so he said Ant-Man. He wanted to see an Ant-Man movie. And this was way before, like, the Marvel movies had kind of blown up. And we were all like, ha-ha, Ant-Man movie, that's ridiculous. No one will ever do that. They did, and it was great. <laughs> and so I did, I, I pinged his assistant afterwards. I'm like, I hope George is happy because that movie ruled. I, I hope he enjoyed it. And 
you liked the movie also? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah big time. Okay. Uh, you started, I think, I th if I recall correctly, it was 2008, Techzilla. Yes, yeah. Okay. So still one of my favorite shows. And so could you tell us more about Techzilla? What was it about? Uh, you made, like you made it into a household name. Yeah, Texella was wonderful. So it was one of the um, flagship shows on Revision 3, which was a very early uh, web video startup uh, that Kevin Rose was one of the founders of. And uh, we, we jumped on there. It was mostly, primarily like old tech TV people and screensavers people, uh, shows that were pretty popular in the States at the time uh, before Comcast purchased them. And uh, we just, it was like, a frat house. I mean, like, we just did whatever we want. We just had a ton of fun, like, creating content. And Patrick Norton is such a fountain of information, and he knows so much about weird things. And he's, uh, he's a genius, and he's still to this day a, a dear friend. And we just had a lot of fun. It was a help and how-to show, so we answered viewers' questions. Uh, we did how-tos. We did product reviews. And I was there for five years. We did that show. And uh, then it went on to... Uh, Patrick is now doing a very similar show with Shannon Morris, who was the host that came on after me, called Tech Thing. Um, and they're funding that whole thing on Patreon. Uh, Patreon, which has made a huge difference for podcasters. Can you please explain sure. to our attendees what Patreon is all about? Um, Patreon is a, a user-supported uh, platform, essentially. It's, it's like Kickstarter, but more sustainable. Um, so instead of raising all of your money up front for a project, like we did, for example, for season two of Sword and Laser on Kickstarter, um, you're able to, to receive payments on a per-project basis. Uh, so, for example, we make a couple thousand bucks per episode of Sword and Laser just from fan contributions. And for us, it, it's not a ton, but it's enough to pay for the show and to enable us to do things like go to conferences and interview authors. And it's, I mean, I know people who are able to quit their jobs and support themselves full-time on Patreon. Tom is one of them. Uh, Tom, when he left uh, This Week in Tech, um, and uh, he started doing Daily Tech News Show. He funds that completely on, on, on Patreon, and that's his career, that's what he does, and it, it sustains him. And to be able to have that direct connection with the fans and to make them essentially, uh, con they're co-op members, you know, it's, it's a, they're, they're co-producers, they call themselves. And uh, it's wonderful because they have an impact on the show and he's able to create content around what they want. Uh. People, and me also personally, mostly know about you through your media personality. Mm -hmm. But you're also doing great works with startups. And you're a, a member of the board that's with some of them. Mm -hmm. And you're an advisor to many of them. Yeah. So how come that like a media personality, a journalist, became interested with the startups in the first place? Yeah, it, it, it started because I was covering them. Um, really, I was doing a lot of video work around some of the early startups, Twitter being one of them. Um, I did a lot of coverage of, of that company back in the early days. Um, I joined in 2006, so I've been on the site for a very long time. Um, and I just fell in love with the startup culture, and I was using all of the products so much, and I was talking to my followers who were using them and having a lot of great input on, on the companies themselves that Tony eventually reached out to me, uh, Tony Conrad. Yeah, just to clarify, yeah. Tony Mink, Tony Conrad. So back in 2008, uh, Tony and I had a meeting about what was to be about.me. And he asked me to come on to be an early advisor uh, to them, which I did up until their acquisition by AOL. Uh, and then after they bought back the company in uh, like, was it last year, the year before? Um, the year before, The I year think. before. Uh, he, he wanted to have advisors again. I said yes, uh, but then he actually asked me this earlier this year to become a board member. And to me, that was, that was thrilling because I, I, to be able to have a, a more of a hand in the direction of the company, I was very excited about. And it's a product that I use every day and I've been evangelizing for many years. Um, so it made a lot of sense and I, I've really enjoyed that experience so far and, and, and what I've learned from it too. And it's in your email signature also. Oh, everything, you betcha. Yeah. And I want it in all of your email signatures too. Your own about.me pages. <laughs> Get on board. <laughs> so what are some of the startups you're involved with? I mean, they can see the list on the website, mm -hmm. but like your favorite or like the biggest success story or the one you had like maybe most issues working with or? 
Uh, the biggest success story is definitely Goodreads. Yeah, uh, Goodreads have, was acquired by Amazon back in 2012. And um, I've, I've stayed close to the company and to Otis um, throughout that time. Uh, but yeah, they've, they've done tremendous amounts of work. Uh, you know, they're integrated into the Kindle experience now, and, and there's definitely going to be more of that in the future. And it's a product that I'm passionate about and that I use all the time. So when that happens, it's really special um, to be able to have an input, in, uh, a small input even, into what the company does. Um, but currently, right now, I'm working with uh, one of Jason's uh, launch companies, Daily Drip. Um, they're, they're a company, a, a platform for learning how to, to code, for example. You get weekly emails. Uh, you get emails every day in the week that are small, bite-sized lessons. Um, and they find that people really absorb that content a lot better in small, bite-sized chunks rather than being confronted with a huge lesson plan um, like Udemy or Code Academy or something like that. Um, so they're, they're just about to take off, and, and I'm really excited about that product. Another one is Forge. Uh, Forge is a way to capture gaming moments uh, in video form and to make highlights from your gaming session. And it's like a, it's like a small social network centered around uh, the exciting things you do during your video game play. And it's PC-based right now, but yeah, who knows, it might, might spread in the future as well. So is it only still that the same one guy using Forge? We gotta get you on Forge, yeah. buddy. No? no? Why? We'll talk later. <laughs> we'll make it work. <laughs> So it's the, s it's the second time from the beginning of the fireside that you've mentioned books? Yes. And Goodreads. Mm -hmm. So you're a huge bookworm, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so a lot of our attendees are also like really big bookworms. One of our official bloggers is like probably the biggest book bookworm in this part of the world. So like your top three picks, recent picks. Okay, um, you can do five or 10 if oh you okay, want. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> That's way less hard. Um, I think for in, in nonfiction, 10% uh, Happier, the, the Skeptic's Guide to Meditation is one of my favorite titles. Um, it's by Dan Harris, who was an anchor at um, ABC News. I want to make sure I get that right and not talk about his competitors. Um, but it's a essentially a, a, a you know, an a agnostic view of meditation, so a non-religious view of meditation and how it can improve your life and, and calm your monkey brain and kind of enable you to have more focus and more concentration and just not be so anxious. I'm a very anxious person. I have a huge social anxiety. I have panic attacks. I mean, that's something I've dealt with my entire life. So I've always been looking for ways to, to relax a little bit and to, to realize that things are not gonna be the end of the world if they don't go perfectly. Or if I'm five minutes late for a meeting, it's not gonna kill me, no one's gonna fire me. Um, so that kind of stuff is something I deal with a lot and, and meditation does help. Oh, more books. That's one. Okay, that's one. Shoot. Team, um, team please take notes because we <laughs> promised our attendees. No, no, no. We promised our attendees that all the books recommended by our speakers will be put up okay. as a, like a reference to read. Um, I loved a, a book called Uprooted by Naomi Novik. Um, she's a fantasy writer. You love it? You love it? It's so good, right? It just won the Nebula Award. It's, uh, it's a fantastic novel. Um, so that was one of my personal favorites. Um, I liked uh, Seven Eves by Neil Stevenson was really great. Um, it's, a, it's a very, they, they call it hard sci-fi because the, the science is, there's some, it's science-ish, um, but hard sci-fi. So they, they say it's based in, in actual science, but it's still science fiction. Um, that was one of my favorites. I just finished Aurora um, by, who wrote Aurora? I can't remember now. Damn it, I know this. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, was another one. That's another, bo both books are about generation shifts. Uh, so if you like to think about where humanity is going to go and we can no longer stay on planet Earth, those are two books for you. Any tips on survival? What? W where should we leave and when should we leave? I think Any the, tips? I don't want to give too much away, but it's, it's probably better that we fix things at home. <laughs> <laughs> Focus on the planet we got. Yeah. Uh, you when we announced you, you sent me your bio. Yeah. And it was out there. Mm -hmm. And we sent it to all the media in the region. Oh, good. And everyone reported in it in like 15 di different languages. And at one point in time, you say, oh, Vladimir, please find and close my new bio and you should update it. And I said, okay, so it's probably like, I'm advisor to three firms, now I'm advising to four firms or mm -hmm. something like that. And I opened the bio and there's like basically, oh, remember what I sent you? 
So none of that. Just delete everything just because I'm not doing down. any of these things anymore. Yeah. So what's up with that? Yeah. So I um I last year in the fall I I announced that I was going to be leaving the world of video production, um and that I was going to do wrap up a few of my projects. For example, people are still crying because of that. No, you broke like many times. It'll be fine. Um, it was uh it was just time. I mean I've been doing I've been doing on camera work uh, since 2005. Um, it's been wonderful. It's it's afforded me many fantastic opportunities. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm just ready for a change, for a professional pivot, and that's been something I've been working on. And it's hard. It's it's hard, kind of leaving something that you know I I know I'm good at it. And but that would be the easy thing to do. Would be to continue doing the thing I know I'm good at for the rest of my career. And I don't even know how long that rest of that career would be. It's it's a hard game. I, I've been a freelancer for, for eight years now, and I'm just ready to not have that same lifestyle. I still want to work hard. I still want to hustle. I just want to hustle for one company as opposed to hustling for my well-being. You know, I want to not have to worry about where the next gig is coming from. I want to have to not have to worry about, you know, it, it's a tough life, and I, I've written about it quite extensively, and I, I think it resonates with a lot of people. I recommend that everyone be a freelancer at some point in their career, because for some people, it's, it's a great thing to do, and for some people, it's that lifestyle is exciting, um, and for some people, it's not, and or you just get sick of it, and that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm ready to, to settle down professionally, I guess, but still, I still want to work really hard and, and build amazing things. Okay, but you said, I, I know I'm good at it. Mm -hmm. I know I can do this for the rest of my life and be good. Mm -hmm. In fact, you're not freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. But you know what might happen like switching careers? You know Mike, Michael Jordan was like the best basketball player ever in your face, Steph Curry? <laughs> oh, that's fighting words. <laughs> okay. I like... <laughs> I told you that. I'm a baseball NBA fan. Fans. I don't. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Do it's not fine. mention mention baseball. I in also Europe. hate baseball. Whatever, it's fine. And then he tried playing golf. Mm -hmm. That's and right. He, yeah, he like <laughs> basically sucked at it. Yeah. Okay, you mentioned, you said, and I wrote something about it, mm -hmm. meaning the transition. Yes. So you're probably referring to your medium post. Yes. There's one sentence I really like about in your medium post. Can I read it out loud? Yes. Okay, so it's only four words, guys. It says, fuck you, pay me. Fuck you, pay me. And you yeah. said it's your official house motto. Yeah, if I was if I was a family on, on Game of Thrones, that would yeah. be our house motto. Yes. Okay, and your family. Not winter is coming, <laughs> fuck you, pay me. <laughs> and in fact, I've almost gotten that like made into a crest to yeah, put in my living that room. That was my like next question. Yeah. That's like the words are easy part. Wh what's the your symbol, quote that parts? is the yeah. problem. That's the problem. Yeah, I got to work that okay, out. So if we have any designers in the house who yeah, want to help me with that you need to work with point. one of our designers yeah. to for the logo. Okay, so what is your family motto all about? What does this four word mean? It's, you know, I think a lot of people, especially in this industry where, and, uh, you know, this kind of resonated too with what, what Danica was talking about in her talk um, was, you know, these these people who work online who have built careers online it's it's still hard work and a lot of times people try to get away with not paying them because they figure oh what you know what's a tweet worth or what's a YouTube video worth um, and you know this is this is careers this is lives and and people take their reputation their you know the social currency very seriously and so you just can't you just can't do it you can't give it away for free and it's uh, I've I've had a lot of problem problems in my life underselling myself, and and not asking for what I'm worth. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of people, especially young women, especially people working on on the internet as their career, uh, have a lot of trouble with. So don't undersell yourself. You know you you have a skill, you have an ability, and it's worth something. So don't let people try to tell you that it's not. Okay, so it's not like your media exposure will pay your house rent, right? Um, no, exactly. Yeah, you can't you can't eat retweets. It's okay. not gonna put food on your table. Okay, so <laughs> you said especially for the young women out there, mm -hmm. we have a lot of young women in here. In fact, they're a majority, even on Spark Me team. Mm -hmm. uh, could you give like could we give them like some real life tips on that one? 
Well, you know, I think, I think Jennifer Lawrence probably said it the best when there was the Hollywood scandal about women not being paid the same as their male counterparts uh, in, in film. And she said, I didn't fight hard enough. You know, she, it's, she was worried that she would be seen in a light that was negative. She was worried that people would be mad at her for asking for equal pay. And that is something I don't know. I don't know if it's a personality thing. I don't know if it's a woman thing. I don't, it's, it's clearly not across the board for all women. I, I can't paint that broad of a stroke. Um, but I know that for me it's been a problem of not wanting to be seen in a negative light and asking for, for too much. Um, and I know that's a problem with a lot of other young women Maybe some men too, but I think it predominantly it seems to be young women in the industry. Um, so being able to to know your worth and understand your worth is 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 super important. There's a saying in management, what you were just talking about, that if you're a male and you have these characteristics you've been explained, you're called a leader. Mm -hmm. And if you're a female and you have exactly the same characteristics, you're called bossy. Y or you're a bitch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you can clap it up, the, the fangirl <laughs> club out there. And I think, I think we're aware of that, and I think that's part of the problem. Ah, so being aware and then getting, abusing it, basically. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, Mr. Bill, can I ask a question? Here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Masha, if I see from the left, yeah? Yeah, yeah okay, thanks. okay. Um, do you think that you paved the way for other women in the industry or that it was just you and that women have to fight every time, like every woman for herself? Um, I, I don't know if I did. I've, I've heard from a lot of women that they just didn't realize this was something they could do. Um, and so that's always been really rewarding is to say, oh, I saw you doing this video. I never even considered doing this as a job. Uh, that's amazing. I'm going to go do it. And what's wonderful now is the barrier to entry to doing video production and to doing audio production and to creating content and making <laughs> audio production. <laughs> um, doing stuff like that is, it's now, it, you know, the price is not a barrier anymore. We have the tools readily available to ourselves to create online content uh, that looks very professional. Uh, so people always ask me, like, how do I get into this? And I'm like, well, you should already be doing it. Like this is something that you can jump into and start creating a back catalog of content for your portfolio um, that people can look back at later. If you wanna work as a video journalist for a company like CNET and they look at your YouTube page and you have six months of video product reviews that you've been doing in your home office or in your kitchen on your own, they're gonna say, wow, she, she loves this. This is what she's passionate about. Um, and so that's, you know, that's something that you can really do to kind of get a head start, a head jump over the competition. Um, and that's what I love about, about web production. But you specifically said the time frame, mm -hmm. and you said six months. So it's not like you do one video and then they well, come with tons of money. if you do one video the day before you send in your resume, that's probably not gonna speak too loudly. Uh, but if you have that back catalog of content, uh, it really, I think, puts you up ahead of the competition makes you stand out. And that's true of almost every industry. If you're a writer, you should be writing on Medium. If you want to get into podcasts, you can be hosting things on SoundCloud. If you want to be doing video, YouTube is there waiting for you. Um, if you want to be doing, if you want to be working with startups, I mean, you can you can build a company now. It's uh, We were talking about that with, uh, who was talking about that? About, um, I don't know, one of the speakers, one of the other wonderful speakers um, was saying, you know, the, the barrier to entry is very low uh, these days. It's a lot cheaper to, to start creating a business or to create content, um, and that's kind of the world we live in now. If I recall co correctly, it was Paul. And the title of his talk was Dis uh, Disrupting Yourselves. Mm -hmm. And what you said and what's in on your website is I'm ready to pivot professionally. So that was the first time I ever heard like using the term pivot mm -hmm. and professionally or personally. It's a personal pivot, yes. Yeah, yeah. So. Companies pivot all the time. I think people can pivot too. You should do a book about this. Should I? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, Paul, Paul's talk really resonated with me a lot and I, I spoke with him about that yesterday as well um, because fear is a huge barrier to that. And for me, you know, being able to, to step aside from what was comfortable and what I knew and to say, yes, this is comfortable, yes, I can do it, but it doesn't make me happy anymore, 
Um, you know, it, it wasn't just one watershed moment. It was many small moments that made me realize that this is fun in many ways, but I, I don't see myself growing as a person anymore. And so I need to figure out what those next steps are. And fear is a, is a huge problem with that because it's the unknown. It's because you're starting at square one. I mean, I'm going to be 34 in a month, and that's, that's, you're no spring chicken in the tech industry when you're 34 in Silicon Valley and a woman. And so it's, you know, going, going into a new profession, going into a new lifestyle is, it's terrifying. And I'm, I'm very scared, but I'm also really excited. And I haven't felt that kind of excitement and energy in many years. Um, so that's, that's what I'm happiest about. So first of all, it's perfectly fine to be scared. Mm -hmm. And it's perfectly fine to acknowledge. Yeah, but you need to have like tons of energy and vision to make it happen. Right. So on your website, it says or like Veronica 1.0. Yeah, and go you back you and look at Veronica 1.0. Yeah, yeah, tons of material about it. Yeah. And there's like one cute photo about Veronica 2.0, mm -hmm. like the background. Can we have like a world exclusive, uh, just a tiny bit about Veronica 2.0? Uh, like the tiniest, tiniest bit. Oh, we're stealing his question. Oh. Okay, Come I'll on, say man. it to you. Like, okay, so <laughs> he's asking about Veronica 2.0. Just disregard me and talk to him. Okay, it's, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I've been primarily talking to companies about product management roles right now because I feel like my experience as an advisor um, has really, that's been the area that I've been most excited about. Um, I love being able to work with many different groups within a company to kind of make a product happen. Um, and it's, it's exciting, but yeah, it's one of those things where you look at the job descriptions and it's three to five years of product management experience necessary. And as a 34-year-old woman who's been in Silicon Valley for a while, they don't really want to hire you as an intern because they say you have too much experience. So you have this weird like seesaw of being too experienced but not having enough experience in the right areas uh, to find a place to land in. So that's kind of what I'm dealing with right now. And it, it, like I said, it's nerve wracking, but I, I, you know, once I get that foothold in somewhere, and I think it'll probably be with a very small company um, where I can do a lot of different kinds of things and, and get the operational experience that I'm looking for. Um, I think that'll be the answer. And, and once I get my, my foot in the door, I think it'll, it'll open a, a lot more opportunities. Um, but yeah, it's hard and it's scary and there's a lot of competition and it's, uh, you know, but it is what it is and it, that's what I want to do. So I have to push for it. And once you get your foot through the door, because we can't have world exclusive right now. So I wish I could give you a world exclusive about okay, your job. Okay, but once you, yeah, <laughs> once you get your foot through the door, can uh, we have like a world exclusive for Spark Me fans? You just call that guy up, sure, not me. So yes. you just call him and you say, I remember your question. Here's the world exclusive. Okay, we'll, we'll make that happen, yeah. W but what was the reaction? Like when you published that, I basically woke up that morning, opened up like my Facebook news feed like I usually do. You were already announced as our speaker and I saw your announcement publicly on Facebook. What were the reaction from people? People were very su extremely supportive, and that's kind of, I've been feeding off of that momentum, I think, ever since then. Um, I think that, you know, being able to use your connections in the tech world is, has been, for me, the most important thing. Um, I haven't gone out and just applied to a job yet. I've been using my network to, <coughs> to get those warm introductions and to meet those people who are friends of friends, and that's extremely valuable. And that's why it's valuable for, for people to come to events like this because you have that opportunity to network and meet people from all over the world. And it's hard to get that sometimes just online. I think there's still a huge amount of value in, in meet space introductions and, and getting face-to-face -face time with people. And uh, it's, it's very different from just knowing someone on Twitter, I think, being able to have that opportunity to have a conversation with someone in real life. And that's hard for a lot of us. I mean, I, I, both Paul and Brian both talked about being extroverted introverts, and I, I, that resonates a lot with me too. It's part of the reason we all work online is because that's where we're comfortable. It's easier for us and more natural for us to have these interactions on, over social media, over Facebook and Twitter. And when we get into a, a situation where we're talking to people in real life, it's, it's, it induces a lot of stress. And uh, overcoming that for me has been huge throughout the years. I, 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 I go back to just interviewing people because that's what I know. So when I meet people in real life, I'll, now that I've 
told you that, you'll probably yeah, see I, it I happening. Yeah, I basically tweeted out the next question for you so you don't have to look at me or listen to me at all. Okay. So. Well, no, no, I just mean like when I talk to a lot of you, if, if it's a conversation, but it's actually me interviewing you because that's what I'm comfortable doing. So I'm, that's what I'm good at, and so that's what makes me feel at ease. Um, and that's how I am able to have conversations with people in real life. Uh, it's just, it's a coping mechanism, I think. We have one question all the way all right. back up. So uh, there's a lot of uh, new YouTubers, uh, podcast, uh, podcast, uh, YouTube networks coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, can you recommend uh, some of the geek focused ones to watch right now? Oh, that's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I love everything that Scott Johnson does on the Frog Pants Network. Um, he's a dear, dear friend of mine, and he it just did, he does so many shows, so many podcasts. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. He's uh, very dedicated to his craft. Uh, he's primarily audio, but he's doing a lot more in the in the YouTube space. Uh, you know, I don't watch a ton of YouTube videos. I'll be honest with you. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and audiobooks. Um, I'm more a in the ear person rather than a watching person. Um, so that's that's hard. But I'll, I'll try to think of some things and and, and post about them. Until recently, uh, dear actually. Okay, sorry, I I didn't see because of the light. There's the. There's a question out there, sorry. Sure. Okay, so I have a question. Because you're searching for a new job, mm -hmm. do you maybe want to be the part of Spark Me team? But just so you know, we don't pay. Okay, okay. <laughs> but Fuck you, you get tons me. of exposure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's funny because I've been getting a lot of offers for, for jobs overseas, <laughs> and uh, in like Sweden, for example, and it, it was wonderful. But it's way but cold here, it's mine. Yeah, it's very nice You here. would prefer it here. Uh, I don't know how my husband would feel Fuck about me Sweden. moving to Europe, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's one Swedish guy out of the, 500 people. The one guy, people, yeah. he's like, come to Sweden. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, I, I, I'm trying to find work in San Francisco. It's, that's where I live, but I, I want to be, uh, weirdly, I want to be in an office. Uh, like, I, I'm ready for that. I don't, you're, she's like, what are you talking about? Why would you want that? Um, a lot of people have been asking me that question when I go in for interviews. Um, it's just, I, I'm ready to have that community and to work day to day with people and be part of a team and, and be like, feel productive in that way. There's a question over here, please one mic, and then one over way up there. I want a water cooler, that's what I want. And a cure uh, yeah. yeah. And then talk Game of Thrones about the water cooler. Talk about Game okay. of Thrones, yeah. Veronica, I love the fact that you don't define yourself as a celebrity, but you are a mentor to many women older and younger than you. So aside from fuck me, pay me, <laughs> what mentorship do you offer to women? <sighs> Some mentorship advice. Some mentorship advice. Um, I think probably the... I, d I didn't have a lot of female mentors uh, through my career, and I still feel that very acutely to this day. Um, I think Molly Wood from CNET is probably the only woman who really had a huge impact in the trajectory of my career and was there to help me. Um, but yeah, seek out other women, I think. It's, it's important to have that network. The mentors I have now, I, I, I adore, You know, whether it be Jason or Tony. I consider my own husband, Ryan, to be a mentor of mine too, because he's pushed me throughout my career to really work harder and take those next steps. Um, but I wish I had more, more female mentors. And it was a very small industry when I was getting started, and there weren't a ton of women doing what I was doing. That's different now. There's, there's a ton of, of brilliant female video journalists and people working in the tech space. And I think, uh, you know, I myself, I love speaking to women who are just getting started in their career, and I learn a lot from them too. So don't be afraid to reach out to someone and to, you know, gr buy them coffee, like take them out for lunch, like have that conversation. Um, I think for me, the haters gonna hate is the biggest bit of advice. Uh, you're never going to escape online trolls. I mean, that is something that anyone who works on the internet feels very acutely day to day. And you know, it's it, if you're not doing something important online then you won't have trolls. But if you're, if you're building something and creating something and putting yourself out there, you're always going to attract the haters because they're not, they're not doing that. And they, they feel that very intensely and it makes them angry. Um, and so one of the reasons I, I'm getting out of video is because it's, it's oh, hello. It's, it's hard for me to, to feel like 
no matter how much work or how good I feel about whatever I'm creating, there's still going to be someone trying to tear me down a few pegs. And I know that will always be true, but just I think personally, I'm just, it's, I'm exhausted by it. It's not, it's by far not the only reason and not even the main reason, but I, I do see how it wears people down over the years. Um, but if you're passionate about doing what you're doing, you have to develop that, that thick skin and have a community of people who understand what you're going through because not everybody does. And they're saying, oh, just blow it off, you know, deal with it, it'll be fine. It's, it, it affects you on a very deep level, I think. Um, and it, it, the negative comments always weigh much more heavily than the positive comments. And I think that's just human nature. Uh, but having other mentors out there, having people who understand is, is very beneficial. So what you told me is like the rule number one is never ever to read online comments. Yeah, don't read the comments. But no. then you told me that actually at one point of time you did. Yeah. And it impacted you like seriously. Yeah, I kind of had a breakdown um, a couple months ago after the, the Game of Thrones premiere, which I was the, the host for. Um, I, I felt great, like I had a great night. It went amazing. I got tons of great feedback from HBO and from the people on the Facebook Live team. And I, I, you know, I left on a super high note. And then I got back to the hotel room and I started reading the comments. And it just, why? Why did I do that? I don't know, I was drunk. Um, and so, <laughs> And, and it just, you know, I, I had a moment of being like, why do we do this to ourselves? Why am I doing this to myself? Why are people awful? And I think just, you know, people, people under the mask of anonymity and, and, you know, not having anything real to say kind of default and forget, they lose that empathy that there's another human being on the other side. And I've spoken about empathy a lot, uh, empathy on the internet is, is one of my other primary talking points at conferences and at events. Um, and it, it's huge to remember that we are all still just people and people have feelings and it sounds like such a grade school level kind of thing to have to remind people of, but you have to be actively teaching empathy and, and in integrating that into your life because we're, we're losing some of that and it's easy to lose it when it's just words on a screen. One of my intellectual crushes, M Mitch Joel, and like I've been trying to get this guy for four years actively to speak at Spark Me. Hopefully it will happen next year. He says, I kn what you said now, I know that we should have thick skin. I know that we shouldn't read comments. I know that I shouldn't deal with haters. But he says, actually, I am a good guy. I have very thin skin and it like deeply, deeply, deeply impacts me. Yeah. Um, my friend Brian Brushwood is uh, incredibly outspoken on his YouTube videos and he gets a lot of hate and every single time he comments back with just love, with like an outpouring of just unbelievable <laughs> compassion and love and hey buddy, like I'm really sorry you didn't like that video, tell me why you feel that way, like let's talk it out, let's do this. Nine times out of ten, it brings the person back around and they're like, oh my God, I'm sorry, I was such an asshole, like blah, blah, blah. And you know, there's always gonna be that, that 1% that's like, or that, that tenth of, of a percent that's, that's never gonna turn around. Um, but I have tried killing them with compassion and kindness in the past and I'm like, why am I putting energy into this? What, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like it's, I think it's better at the end of the day, like you'll, you'll turn some of them around, but it's probably better to just ignore it, that sounds so defeatist. Like I hate even saying that. I wanna be that guy that talks to every single troll and tries to bring them back around, but it's impossible sometimes. There was a question up. Hello, I'm glad that you mentioned Brian Brushwood <laughs> because uh, we love his show, it's my son's favorite. Oh nice. And actually my question was about him, um, I'm sure that he, shared some of uh, his best secret live hacks with you. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you to share maybe the one you think the best uh, with us here today. Okay, uh, well he did teach me how to eat fire, uh, which was very scary, but very fun. That's not really a, a, life, a life hack. Um, I think my favorite video that he did recently <laughs> was how to get cheaper Taco Bell um, by ordering different combinations of things to make the more expensive items. So if you want, like, this is not relevant. Do you guys, do you have Taco Bell in this no. part of the world? But okay. Let <laughs> me interrupt relevant. you for a second. Sure. Uh, uh, Messy remark to the team. 
because Brian wanted champagne and he got champagne. Oh. And then Sarah wanted... I do not want alcohol. You guys no. partied me too hard no, last no. night. I'm good. But <laughs> we need... We need fire right now for Veronica nope. on stage. No, nope. yeah. no, no, that's a disaster waiting to happen. <laughs> I need, yeah, I need Brian being around to show you how to do that is key. Uh, but it, it's actually pretty easy. So you just, you, you have to get the angle right. I am not going to mime it because it's going to look really obscene okay. uh, out of context. Uh, yeah, um, but it's, <laughs> it will. Um, but you have to, you just have to close your mouth in the right way to cut off all the oxygen to the flame. And it works, and you don't hurt yourself too badly. <laughs> a little badly. It's a little singe. It's not a big deal. Um, but Brian's, Brian's wonderful. He is a, he's just an unbelievable creator, and he's so smart and so funny and one of my dearest friends. And if you haven't watched his videos, uh, Scam School, all of his stuff is, is fantastic. Yeah, Scam School is probably like yeah. the most legendary show ever. He's the best. You mentioned Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm season five and season six premiere. Season six was like r recently and we heavily promoted that one. And you, believe me, you did a fantastic job. Oh, thank like you. Like really a fantastic job. But how did it came for the premiere? I don't know. <laughs> um, they asked me to do it back in 2014 for the season so four season premiere. Four? Yeah. It was the first time they asked me, and I had just recently fallen and broken my ankle and wrist playing tennis. <laughs> Clearly not as good yeah, not as, as your good other as top Ivanovich, now. But almost, almost, yeah. Um, and uh, so I couldn't do it. And it was one of the most crushing defeats in my career up until that point. I was so unbelievably heartbroken that I couldn't do it that I just, I, I just cried and cried for hours. Uh, because I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan, and for me, that would have been like the pinnacle of everything. And then I was thrilled because they asked me to come back the next year and, and do it for the season five premiere. And so myself and the other red carpet hosts, uh, we had a great time. Um, but she was like the primary host. And, and so I didn't get to talk to yeah. a lot of my That's favorite what people. That's what I was about to say. Like, she got all the best characters last she year. She did. I know. I was and so I jealous. hated her for that. Oh, don't know. She was, she was super nice. Very, very nice woman. Um, and then they asked me to come back this year. And it was, uh, it was just me. And it was just an hour of nonstop, like there was no break. And it was all on Facebook Live, and uh, it was, I was terrified going into it, but as soon as it started, it just was automatic. And uh, it was a lot of fun, and everyone was really great, and I, I didn't get any spoilers, but I did get to see the first episode. Um, yeah, only President Obama got to see the season in advance of anyone else, so no, no special treatment. He gets the ultimate special treatment. So no full season for you, just the first episode? Just the first episode, yeah. We were hoping what you could put up on a torrent so we can all watch the full <laughs> season before it airs. <laughs> no spoilers. So this year, like last year, it was just half of the characters. This year, it was the whole cast. It was everybody. Yeah. 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 And I saw somewhere that you said that, like, probably, like, Khaleesi is my favorite character. She was great. Yeah, Daenerys. But I, yeah. yeah. But I also like Tyrion. So if you could pick, because you told that guy you cannot pick two. If mm -hmm. you had to pick like just one, but the character in the show no, or in the book, whatever, not like the actor, which one would you pick? Hodor. <laughs> <laughs> well, C Christian's an amazing person. Um, if you ever have the opportunity to see him DJ, he's Actually, phenomenal. Actually, I invited him to DJ. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <gasps> but he couldn't make it okay. happen. Okay, yeah. well, maybe next year. Maybe yeah. he'll be my yeah. person yeah. I get for you. Okay. Um, so we used to we used to play Warcraft together. So he he was uh, we played World of Warcraft. Uh, we were on very different time time zones, so it was difficult. Um, but mostly like when he was. I think his early in the morning was my late at night, and so we would bump into each other sometimes if I was on super late. Uh, but he plays Horde. He's awesome. And uh, he's just a wonderful, dear, dear, good person. Like, everything you've seen about him being great is all true. He's, he's got the biggest heart. I, I also mean that literally, probably. Um, <laughs> big, big in kindness and also size. Um, but he's, he's, a, he's a wonderful person, yeah. And if I'm right, on your Snapchat, on Sunday night, you actually cried when you watched the, the episode? Oh, yeah. Like, hey, no spoilers. Let's not, can we not? I mean, not if I'm uh, I really that. hope all of us are like big uh, Game of Thrones buffs who you already seen the last week's episode. But, okay, yeah. sorry. There's a lot, of, a lot of, I mean, are we surprised that no, sad, I, bad things I, happened on Game of Thrones? But don't you spoil I mean, it. I only said you cried. I did. I yeah. cried like a baby. Yes. Yeah. So he like hurt, sobbed. He like hurt his 
wrist playing tennis, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, he did. Very badly. <laughs> like I'm not going to do spoilers. Stop okay. it. But very badly beyond repair. Okay, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough out of you. <laughs> if you had to pick like one of the actors, mm -hmm. but not as a character, as an actor, and you cannot pick Hodor twice, okay, you would pick. So as my favorite, yeah. Oh, it's so Maisie Williams probably. Um, uh, Arya Stark. She is. She's also just so sweet and, and really kind-hearted. Everyone. Everyone was really really great. There were maybe two exceptions, who I'm not going to name, but everyone else was, now I cannot <laughs> do that to my career. Well, my old career, I guess. Who cares? Maybe I should. Okay, so you should. Uh, Go on. <laughs> it's not like they're Snapchatting or tweeting or I'll live streaming. I'll just say, or based on the show, they might be who you expect. Um, but okay, yeah. they <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, everyone else was, was phenomenal. And they weren't even bad. They were just difficult, like a little harder to interview. Are we looking for questions or yeah, are they trying yeah, they're to guess? They're, um, because <laughs> I, I can't see. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Did you watch uh, World of Warcraft movie? If not, are you excited? I am excited. I heard it doesn't get, hasn't gotten very good reviews, so I'm a little worried, but I will definitely still watch it. I'm very sad that there are not Torin in the movie, I've heard, uh, because Torin are my favorite race. Um, so that, that's kind of a downside for me. I love my cow people. Um, but it's, it's okay, maybe in this, if there's ever a sequel. I know it's early on in the history of, of, of the world, so maybe that's why. Okay, we got one under there. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Asiad from a country called Fuck You, Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question for you. And uh, with what we do, we are trying to use a lot of female streamers. And since I'm not a girl, I'm gonna ask you what's the best approach. Many of the female streamers that we work with, uh, streamers, YouTubers, Twitch uh, artists, they tend to underestimate themselves mm -hmm. and they expect a lot less from themselves. I don't know if it's the age or whatever it is. And we try to encourage it. What are your best tips to bring that out when it's a male dominant team that try to encourage female streamers? I th that's a really hard question. I think probably the, the best thing I can say is be there for them, have resources for them, you know, support them. If they're having trouble, like, help them with that. If there's, you know, if there's an issue where they're being harassed on their streams, like, have moderation. Like, make sure that they're being protected from that because when you're just starting out, that kind of, that kind of hatred, that kind of stress can really put a damper on your passion for what you're doing. Um, so yeah, just being supportive, being a community, and, and being there for them, I think, is, is absolutely key. And you know, maybe having them talk to other people doing what they're doing, other women, is you know, it, it's important too. Yeah. One more question. Uh, technically, you're allowed only one question, and you said I stole yours, so go ahead. And <laughs> it doesn't work. It does. Work. We hear yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Hodor. Hodor. <coughs> uh, just few few remarks because. Vladimir and I are, you know, the fangirl club. Um, I don't know what that means. He said, it's a, like, it Ver Veronica Belmont fangirl oh, club. Oh, I thought you said the bad girl club, oh, and I was yeah. like, what's that? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he's, like, really bad, but... Yeah, okay. so, so I just wanted to um, defend uh, one statement that I made about celebrity, you being a celebra celebrity. And it has to do with all other questions uh, for women equality in, in the tech world, in streamers, and everything else. You also me mentioned um, Emma Watson. Mm -hmm. So I would like to compare all that and say that you are Emma Watson of the blogger community and, you know, YouTubers. <laughs> So uh, why I think you are a celebrity because you are you are empowering women to be more like you and Emma Watson does the does the same in her own way. She does, yeah. And uh, we need that as a we, male. We as women. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, we need everybody. we yeah, need yeah, more empowered. Club. He's need gonna cry now. Yeah, I think. yeah. yeah Just we take need the mic out of him. Yeah, we need more empowered women. It's a uh, it's a. Uh, to do what you do, so that's why we are fangirling over. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, she's wonderful. I think she she really puts herself out there, and not. I think a lot of young actresses in in that industry, 
are, you know, it, they, they worry about their career. They don't want being outspoken to damage their career or damage the relationships they have. Um, but, you know, she's in a very privileged place where, you know, she, she has that worldwide stage. And I think it's wonderful that she's doing that. And, and her, she's got this amazing book club now where she's, you know, getting other women to read, you know, feminist and empowered books. And, I, yeah, if I can help that in some small way, like, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it. You already did. Oh, thanks. <laughs> you know what's the last question we ask every single one of the speakers this year? So it's yes. our house motto for this year, and it's what lights your spark? I think embracing change. I think not being afraid or, or using that fear to motivate yourself. Because if you're not scared, if it doesn't give you fear, then it's probably not worth doing. If you're too comfortable, if it's, if it's too easy, then you're not pushing yourself. Um, so I'm trying to really light that spark <laughs> inside me to, and, and use that, that energy to, to push myself forward. And I think that's, you know, it's been wonderful hearing all the other speakers also embracing that notion. Um, and I think it's, it's wonderful. So that's, that's what I, that's, that's lighting my spark right now. That was awesome. Like embracing change should be like, like one sentence should come out of this spark me. And I'm really glad it m made light your spark. So like fingers crossed for your next project. Thank you. You promised that guy like the world exclusive, remember? Okay. Yeah. So please give it up for Veronica Belmont. Thank you.